So uh, good afternoon. My name is Jerry Williams, and I am the founder and president of Myositis Support and Understanding Association, MSU. And I would like to welcome you to Flip Negativity. Uh, Janet was so kind to join us in September. She joined us for the uh, Power of Forgiveness. It was a fantastic webinar, and I hope that you've had the opportunity to take a look at it. And if you haven't, we'll be posting that link in the uh, chat section so that you can access that later on. So, J so Janet, uh, again, uh, thank you again for joining us uh, today. Um, Janet has uh, over 30 years of experience in the health promotion field, um, and she retired in May of 2007 as the director of the prevention and wellness at, um, excuse me, the director of prevention and wellness at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. She, uh, her husband had a dementia uh, disease, a movement disorder dementia, which she wrote about in her book, Finding Meaning with Charles. And um, we have uh, a link to her website where you can also find that book. Um, Janet has a master's degree from the Georgia State University. And uh, again, I'll post that link so that you can read more about Janet and the work that she does with uh, caregivers and care partners and health and all kinds of good stuff that Janet's into. So. Um, so with that, uh, welcome, Janet, and thank you again. Oh, Jerry, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. People may not know, Jerry and I bumped into each other last year at the uh, Myositis Conference, and it's been wonderful to stay connected. So I'm happy to, happy to be here. Let me go ahead and bring up my slides. Yes, Janet was so kind. I was having a little bit of trouble <laughs> maneuvering with my breakfast and stuff, and she was like the little mother I needed at the, at the moment, and we just <laughs> instantly clicked. Yeah, we were just so fortunate to have sat next to each other to, to build this friendship. So I'm very, very thankful for that. So anyway, today we're going to talk about flipping negativity. And before I even change to my next slide, I want you all to think about what negativity you are facing right now. Obviously, with your disease, right? There's things that are challenging, um, depending on where you are in the process, right? Up or down. And also, you know, we're all in COVID. And I was just telling Jerry, I found out yesterday that uh, I'm in May, I live in Maine and my, uh, my most of my family's in South Carolina now. And uh, my sister and brother-in-law just got diagnosed with COVID. And we're really worried about him because he's got some significant heart disease, even though he's quite healthy otherwise. So, you know, it's, it's weighing heavy on me tonight, and it may be weighing heavy on you tonight for whatever reason, but I think the tools that we talk about tonight can be helpful in these huge uh, uh, negativity and challenges that we're facing, but also, and especially in the little day-to-day -day ones, right? All the things that kind of throw you over the edge, they're, but they're little, but they're, they can just do that to you. So let's take a look at some of these ideas. From Jack Sparrow, Pirates of the Caribbean, he says, the problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude about the problem. And that truly is what flipping negativity is all about. Uh, I'll be laying out for you how negativity is what our brains like to do. However, we've got the ability to flip that if we have the right attitude about it and make some effort for that. So I wanted to start off talking a little bit about positivity and negativity. So I want you to think about how much positivity do we need? There's a researcher, Barbara Fredrickson, who found that there's a tipping point between the number of positives and negatives to kind of keep us in balance. So for, for one positive, how many, ne um, I'm sorry, for one negative, how many positives do we need to balance it out? So I often give this question in my workshops. Is it one to one? Maybe it's three, three positives to one negative. Is it nine to one or is it 12 to one? So make your own guess. All right. And the answer is about three to one. Um, it five to one, seven to one is, is probably in the right ballpark as well. But it's certainly not one to one. And it's not 12 or more to one, because when you get to that many positives, every negative, we might be living a little bit in Pollyanna land, which I'm sure many of you probably really don't do. You've got enough of a reality to keep you grounded. 
But why do we need more positives for each negative? Well, they say that negatives are like Velcro. They stick to us. And this is the way our brains were made so that we are careful about what's gone wrong in the past to avoid it in the future. Positives, they say, are like Teflon. They just keep sliding off and sliding off. They don't stick. We need them and they're important for us, but not as important as making sure the negatives don't happen again. So we need to think about ways that we can get those positives to stick, to balance our negatives. And I'll just tell you quickly one fun way to do that. At the at every evening, um, some of you may be doing a gratitude list in the evening, and this is a similar practice to that. But every evening, if you could just ask yourself, and if you have a significant other, do it with your significant other, and ask yourself, what went well today? You might have had a stinky, terrible day, but I promise you, even in those days, there are some things that go well. So I want you to think about what those are, and they like you to think about at least three. So you have to dig deep to get to three. But even if it's something simple, like you enjoyed the chocolate chip cookie that you that you ate at lunch, uh, but maybe it'll be more meaningful, like you had a phenomenal talk with your sibling or a friend. So if you can think about those at night, the three what went wells, then you can savor them. You can relive them. Talk to your significant other about them and they can help buoy you up and provide a better, a stronger balance uh, with the positives and negatives. So think about that, three positives to every negative and proactively look for the positives. Now, another study I wanted to share is the percent of our happiness that is impacted by our attitude and choices. So think about that. Jack Sparrow says it's all about our attitude. Well, what percent? Do we have some control over? Well, let me share the answer to that. So we're going to start, first of all, with what is not the answer, which is not 10%. Um, this was researched by Sonia Lombersky, and she uh, took a look at all the happiness studies at the time to find out what truly was impacting happiness. And she said that 10% of our happiness is impacted by the external circumstances around us. It could be a positive thing like winning the lottery. It could be a negative thing like your myositis, like a hurricane, like the fires they had out west, um, like COVID, which we don't have a lot of control over. So 10% is external to us. So when I'm in my groups, I ask people, well, how does that feel? Does that sound about right? And most people say, no, it seems like that should be more. But that's not what the research found. So let's look at the rest of this pie chart. The next 50% of how of, of what impacts our happiness is the genes that we got from our parents. Some of us popped out much more optimistic. Others popped out much more pessimistic. And everybody else is somewhere in between. So this 50%, we have no control over. This is what we were born with and how we see the world and how we feel about our optimism versus pessimism. So this is our baseline. Now, we can't do anything about the 10% external. We can't do anything about this 50%. And if you have a high pessimism on your 50%, you, like someone in my group, might say, oh, boy, now I'm screwed. But in fact, it's really important to look at the rest of this pie chart. And that's where we get the 40% that our attitude can make a difference. So 40% is up to us. We can't do the 10%, can't do the 50%, can't modify that. But we do have some opportunity to find our own happiness, like doing things like the what went well activity and some of the things we talk about today to flip negativity. So that 40% is what we use to do that. It's a choice. Now, what, what our brains do, like I've already mentioned, is we have this negativity bias. Our brains want to protect us. And so we're going to remember, as I've already said, we're going to remember those negative things that happen to us. 
And that's just the way the brains work. Now, this is happening in these way down the bottom here. See where those lines are pointing to the amygdala. You may have heard about the amygdala. It's the fight, flight, or flee, um, or freeze part of your um, part of your brain. So it's where threats come from. It's the primitive part of our brain, and it is the fast brain. It is the unconscious brain. So if if there's a threat coming at us, we will immediately respond without having to stop and think. It just happens. So this is where all that negativity can come out. Because again, the brain's trying to protect us from negativity. This now, is, what's this yeah. is part of the brain? We have a, a member with myositis that uh, talks with us about anxiety, and she's a, a therapist. And so this is what she calls the survival brain. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Jerry. That's a good way to think about it. The survival brain, absolutely. Now, to counter that, as humans, we have this prefrontal cortex. This is the rational part of the brain. This is the part of, bra of the brain that we can choose our attitude. And it's the part of the brain that we can make better choices and that we can consciously try to turn negativity into positivity for our thoughts and feelings. The problem is it's the slow brain. So it doesn't, it doesn't it's not automatic. The survival brain, that's automatic. But the slow brain, we have to proactively engage. And that's what we're talking about today. We want to engage this prefrontal cortex. And this is where we get our chance to use our 40%. The problem is it's slow. So uh, we got to take some deep breaths. If I, I think one way to understand the two brains is, have you ever said something that you regretted? If I ask people to raise their hand, everybody raises their hand, right? Um, so what's happening there is we get mad, right? We say something and we haven't engaged the, the, the prefrontal cortex. We've just gone from that survival brain and the fast brain and whoops, it came out before we even had a chance to think about it. Where what we could do is take a deep breath, go for a walk, get our thoughts together and have a better response. So that's another technique we can use to flip negativity. The more we practice using this prefrontal cortex, the more the neurons in the brain start wiring that way. So that's sort of good news. Um, and now that we can do MRIs, we can we can actually see how these how this happens. So the more that we do positivity and we flip our negativity, those neurons are going to fire together. They're going to wire together. And then we're going to, it's going to be easier going forward. So take a look at this picture. Think, look at what you notice. But why couldn't we have focused on the sun? I mean, the flowers are still dead. <laughs> we can't do anything about that. But there is a sun there. So this is an important concept also in flipping negativity. We are not ignoring the negative. It is real. It's absolutely real. The challenges are real. All we're saying is, do we have to always focus, like on the left picture, do we have to always focus on the challenges? Is there something around us or that we're experiencing that is the sunshine that we can at least bring some uplift to our day? And our mindset matters. What we put into our brain, what we think about, focus on, ruminate on, affects us and affects us throughout our whole body. And I, I love this study. I don't know if you guys have heard this maybe in another talk, because this is a study that's been around for a long time. It's by Ellen Langer. She did it back in 1979. So it's, 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 it's been there a while. In 1979, she took 75 year old men, All right, They were 75 years old. And she gave them all kinds of physical and mental tests. And then what she did is she took them for a one week retreat in New Hampshire. And they were to think about being 20 years younger. So they were to pretend that they were 55, even though they were 75. She had clothes, jackets and clothes for them to wear that would have been in style 20 years earlier. Uh, at that time, 20 years earlier, President um, Eisenhower would have been in the White House. They were to think about that. She had magazines around. 
um, Life Magazine, Saturday Evening Post that were all of that particular time period. She made everything feel 20 years younger and they were to think like they were 20 years younger. They spent a week at this retreat doing all kinds of things, even touch football. They went back and she put him into the lab and checked all the all the tests again, physical and cognitive tests. They improved on absolutely every one. So their flexibility improved, their strength improved, their cognitive function improved. But here's what really blew my mind. Their vision and their hearing improved. So exactly. <laughs> so this is what's so fabulous about surrounding ourselves with positivity. So being 20 years younger is very positive for these 75 year olds. Being around this positivity actually will impact us physically. At least the study seems to say that. So here are the four, I've given you a couple little strategies already, but here are the four strategies I wanna focus on for the rest of our talk today. The first is flip negative thinking. So let's look at this quote from Truman. A pessimist is one who makes difficulties of his opportunities. And an optimist is one who makes opportunities of his difficulties. That's what we're trying to do. Opportunities are difficult. The difficulties are there. How do we make opportunities of them? So in this section on flip negative thinking, I'm going to give you three questions you can ask yourself to try to flip negative thinking. We're going to take them one at a time with some examples. The first question you can ask yourself, if something bad happens, you can say, how can I see this from a positive standpoint? And, you know, just off the top of my head, I hadn't planned to talk about this because this is all new to me with my uh, family with COVID. Um, I'm thinking right now, how can I see this situation from a positive point of view? Well, what I can tell you is all my siblings have come to the fore to get to help my sister and, and my brother-in-law. So it's um, it's really been wonderful to see how we've all come and each one of us taken a part to relieve some of the uh, the other pressures that they had because that particular sister was doing most of the oversight and care for my mom. So we've taken that on. So um, so that's one example that I was just thinking just now as I'm facing uh, that situation. But how can I see something that's not so good from a positive standpoint? So let me give you just a basic example. You get in your car tonight or tomorrow and the brake light indicator light comes on. Well, let's think about that. If I'm going down the negative trap, what's my brain going to say? Well, ooh, it's going to cost me money. I got to go to the mechanic. I don't really like or trust my mechanic. You know, we get to all that negative. Oh, it's going to take me extra time I don't have. Now in COVID, I don't want to go out. I mean, we could go lots of ways. However, if we use this question, all right, how can I see this from a positive standpoint? I have this negative thing happening, this frustration with my brakes needing to be fixed. How can I see that from a positive point of view? Well, one way is to say, oh my goodness, I'm so glad cars have this. So I'm not out driving and my brakes go, right? So um, this is what this question is all about. And I was thinking with your myositis, let's say the situation is it takes too long to get ready in the morning, depending on what type of myositis you have. So you can think about the negative of that. Well, I'm always, you know, if I've got early morning doctor appointment, I'm always rushed and I'm always late to the doctor appointment. You can say the negative of that could be, um, it just makes me so frustrated. I used to be able to, you know, just do it quickly. And now it takes so much time. Or something like you, the negative might be, well, it feels like a waste of my valuable time. You know, darn, this doesn't feel right and fair. All right, that's the negative. Now, let me tell you, that survival brain's going to go there first. It just is, right? So you've got to stop. Once you recognize that you're going to the negative, take a deep breath and start to engage this front part of the brain and think about, okay, what could be something positive? Could I see this at all from a positive viewpoint? And it might be things you're learning. It might be 
well, this is helping me learn to better manage my time. Um, this is helping me learn more patience. I struggle with patience, so I need this to help me learn patience. Um, if my care partner is helping me in the morning, that's giving us some time together. That could be a positive. And maybe, just maybe, this is an opportunity for me to practice accepting my myositis since I can't control that I have it. So those are ways that I thought of, you might think of others, that you could flip this with that question of how can I see this from a positive standpoint? So I hope that makes sense to you. The next question is, what is it I really want? So a lot of times our negativity is coming because we're complaining. Things aren't quite right and we're complaining about it. And this question really helps with complaints. So one thing a lot of us complain about is we're just overwhelmed. Um, so much to do, not enough time. We feel just pressured um, in a different way now during the pandemic. But if you think back to pre-pandemic, you can think about how hectic life was in a different way. So being overwhelmed is what you don't want. And if this question is, what is it I really want versus what I don't want? What do I really want? When you think about think about this, what do you really want when you're overwhelmed? Well, you want to not be overwhelmed, but that's not what you really want. So, I mean, it is what you really want, but that doesn't help you get to something actionable. So you could say something like, my answer's here. I want control. I want to be able to stick with my priorities so I don't get going on these time wasters uh, that make it so that it's harder for me to get the most important things done. I want to find more efficient ways to do things. I can see this, especially with myositis. It would be helpful to find more efficient ways. So this is the positive that it get. I can see in being in this overwhelmed situation. And maybe that I need to get assistance. And I accept that I need some assistance every now and then. So that's one way to think about, and you might have some others you could come up with about what I really want when I'm overwhelmed. So those first two questions, like the first question really works well on um, frustrations. The second question really works well when we're complaining about something. Oh, by the way, with the second question, think about if you have a significant other and they come in complaining about I don't know, the weather or the this or the that or something's not working. Just let them complain for a little while and then just stop and say, all right, I hear that this isn't going well. What is it you really want? And then get them to flip it and you'll be amazed. It's not easy, but you'll be amazed that you'll get some actionable items. And then the third way to flip negative thinking is to think about, well, when have I had success before? Because that could renew some things that worked, right? So let's think about that. One example would be, oh my goodness, you've got a new conflict with a friend or a family member and you're not getting anywhere. It's not working out well. It's just not, it's just gotten worse and worse. So you could say, wait a minute. I know I've had success turning some bad relationships around. What did I do? What were the things that I tried that made it work? So when you think about your situation, here are some of the things maybe you would try. Oh, I remember when I was seeking to understand them first, instead of them having to understand me, that helped me get through the conflict. Or when I used some of those active listening skills where I reflected back what the person said so they knew that I was hearing them. Or when I had empathy for the person, even though I thought they might have done me wrong, I still understood maybe a little bit about what they're going through and maybe why things didn't go as well as I had hoped they might. And maybe I had success when I showed that I cared for them, but also clearly expressed the challenge and the concern. So I was good at sharing that I cared and also what the concern was. So if you can reflect back to what's worked for you in the past, now you've got those top of mind, you can use them in whatever the situation is. Now, everything I've given you for these three questions are just examples. You'll have your own situations popping up. 
And I just like you to think about when something pops up that's negative, think about which one or maybe all three of these questions could help you flip your thinking. So again, if you have questions on this, ask them in the Q&A and I'll get to them at the end. So next I wanna talk about switch thinking patterns. The thinking patterns I'm talking about are typical thinking patterns of a pessimist versus an optimist. The pessimist tends to have more negative thinking patterns, the optimist more positive thinking patterns. So what might it look like? So if I'm a pessimist and something bad happens, I might say, it's my fault. I'm the reason for the failure. I might say, it's going to last and affect my whole future. Bad things always happen to me. I might as well stop trying. I won't be successful. On the positive, someone with a more optimistic viewpoint when something bad happens might say something like this. I know why this happened and I can correct it. It doesn't have to happen again. I had a bad off day. This bad thing is temporary. And besides, it's only one part of my life. I'm confident that I could change it with persistence and a better strategy. See the huge difference between these thinking patterns? So let's look a little bit about what's going on here for the pessimist and the optimist. The pessimist sees things as permanent, such as perpetual, long lasting, enduring. So they're going to say things like, it's going to last. It'll affect my whole future, right? They really exacerbate it all to, to huge forever, ever. Where an optimist sees it more temporary. Okay, this was a brief, it was kind of a passing situation, kind of a short term thing. I don't have to catastrophize it to everywhere. So this bad thing, they might say something like, this bad thing is only temporary. It won't last forever. So that's di the different thinking. Another way that the thinking is different, the pessimist or the more negative thinking is pervasive. That means it's persistent, it's widespread, it's universal. That's where they say things like, the bad things always happen to me. Versus if you're more optimistic, you think it's only specific. And that's where that one, whereas I had a bad day, I had an off day. It was just that one day. It wasn't my whole life. And then, um, Personalized. So on the personalized, the pessimist might see when we saw that it's all my fault. I'm the reason for the failure. That's I'm personalizing the problem to me. I'm the bad person. I, I did it all wrong. Where the optimist doesn't take it that personal it, to that degree of personal uh, personally. Um, they know why it happened and they figure they can correct it. It's not you know, a, a, a fatal flaw. And it doesn't have to happen again. See, they can do something so it doesn't become perpetual. And they're confident that they can change it with persistence and a better strategy. So the optimist in all of these sort of takes control. The pessimist almost relinquishes control. So think about what you're saying to yourself when you go through struggles. Where, you know, you have a problem, made a mistake, something went wrong, where does your brain go? And if it goes to the pessimist side, I want to encourage you to try to flip it. Ships don't sink because of the water around them. Ships sink because of the water that gets in them. Don't let what's happening outside you get inside you and weigh you down. So that's switch thinking patterns. Try to get to a more optimistic thinking pattern. The next I have up here is get rid of ants. Do you know what ants are? Automatic negative thoughts. <laughs> Automatic. These are the things that just pop out, these negative thoughts that get us into some grooves. And we want to get out of those grooves. And so there's uh, these six is probably more, but these are pretty common uh, patterns and grooves that we can get into that they call distorted thinking or cognitive distortions. So we're going to go through each one of these because I think all of us are going to definitely um, relate to a couple of these, if not all of them. 
Some of us are really good at catastrophizing things. So this is when we blow things way out of proportion. We exaggerate the bad and we discount the positive. Um, we believe the worst case scenario in whatever the situation is. So catastrophizing. So one example of how that might uh, play out. Um, let's say that you forget about uh, appointment you have with your doctor and you totally miss the appointment. So if you're catastrophizing, your brain might say, oh my goodness, I missed the appointment. Oh, my doctor's gonna be so unhappy with me. In fact, gonna charge me extra, but he may kick me off the rolls. You know, maybe he's the kind that doesn't like this and I'm, I'm gonna be gone. I'm not gonna have my doctor. Oh my goodness, without that doctor and I have to find a new doctor, how am I gonna do that? Because most aren't taking new patients. My myositis is gonna go out of control. You see how that just got blown up and blown up and blown up. Um, another thing I thought about of catastrophizing that many of you have maybe struggled with is saying to yourself, my myositis diagno uh, diagnosis has ruined my entire life. Now, in fact, it has been a life changer and it has in fact affected your life in profound ways. But has it ruined your entire life? I'm not, I'm looking right now at Jerry. No, it hasn't. You're probably as much engaged in life and contribute to life and finding meaning in life than you ever have, right? So we still have lots of positives in our life, even though you are, you know, wrapped around this, this myositis that is uh, affecting your bodies. So we've got maybe um, this is our time when we're getting closer to our friends and our family um, and the support that they're giving as an example. But there's a lot of positives that could be happening there. So when you find yourself catastrophizing, um, think about, well, what's the worst case uh, scenario realistically? Not what you dream out there is the worst case, but what's realistic, the worst case. And then sometimes it says, well, What's that going to be like in a month or two or three? And I know with most uh, myositis, there could be um, continual changes. But on the little frustrations in life, how's that, you know, the fact you got the flat tire, you know, how's that going to, what big, what kind of big deal is that going to be uh, in, in the long term? So that's the way to deal with um, catastrophizing. I, my favorite quote was it a bad day or was it a bad five minutes that you milked all day? Don't we love to do that, right? We like to wallow in that negative that feels good for some reason. But put it in perspective. It was five minutes. <clears throat> Let me just get a quick drink. Next is all or nothing. This thing thinking is very rigid thinking. It's black or white, very rigid categories. So this might be the kind of thing where you when you're in the grocery store and you're and, you know, the other lines are going much faster and you say to yourself, I always pick the wrong line. Or it could be at the end of the day, you say, you know, things didn't go well. and You say, boy, I wasted my entire day. When, in fact, you probably did get some things accomplished, even though the bulk of it seems like it was wasted. So the all or nothing threw you over to saying everything was bad when, in fact, not really. Um, another good way to understand all or nothing is think about if you have children and your kid comes in with the report card with four A's and one B, and let's say it's a high achieving kid, they might say it's a terrible report card, right? That would be an all or nothing thinking. And I think back to some of my sisters, um, they were either 100% on a diet or 100% off the diet, right? There, there's nothing in between. That's all or nothing thinking. So a way to deal with that is instead of thinking black and white, think of acceptable shades of gray. What would be okay in the middle and find a compromise for that. The next, I guarantee every one of us does this, unless you're really mindful of it, is saying should statements. 
which is I must, I should, I have to do this certain thing. It's rigid rules for yourself. And we also put should statements on other people, right? <laughs> so you might have thought about this in the past. I'll just remind you of, of these should statements. When you when you say I should do something, you're putting pressure on yourself. And then you will eventually resent yourself. just like scolding. It's going to make you feel guilty. There's nothing good, really, that comes from using the word should, must, or have to. So a couple of examples. Today, you might have said, I should get some exercise today. It's very common, right? I would like to say instead, either get some exercise or don't get some exercise. But don't say to yourself, I should exercise today. Either do it or don't do it. But why should you be scolding yourself? It's not going to help anything. <laughs> Same thing with um, having that cookie. I shouldn't eat that cookie. Well, either eat it and enjoy it. And I say savor it if you're going to eat it or don't eat it. But the more you say should, the more you're just slapping yourself. And we don't need that. Um, now, if you think about other people, you might say something like, my friends should visit me more. Let's think pre-COVID. And maybe now it would be they should be calling me more, Zooming with me more, whatever. My friends should be connecting with me more. So that's a valid feeling. However, what it's doing is it may be causing you to resent your friends who are not coming to visit. And that resentment isn't helping those relationships. So I encourage you instead to say, to not say that, and instead just enjoy the people that do connect with you, reach out to the ones who don't, and hopefully you can connect with them, but don't scold them, don't make them feel guilty, and certainly don't um, resent them by saying should. All right, perfectionism. I do not have this problem. <laughs> But I do know that people who do, it's entrenched, it's deep, and it's very hard to shake. So those of you who are perfectionists, you know who you are. And I just want to say that um, when you're perfectionist, you say everything, this thing must be done perfect all the time. And where that goes, or it's awful or shameful if we don't, and where that goes awry is when some things really don't need to be perfect, be done perfectly. And so you end up wasting time because you put all that time into making that little insignificant thing perfect. And so what happens is you waste time and you miss maybe some more important things that you could put your time into. Relationships, writing, reading, uh, thinking, other things that could be more uh, engaging. So um, some ways that we might do perfectionism. Um, if you're drafting an email to a friend and you go back and you correct, correct every grammar piece in it, <laughs> you know, probably not worth your time. Just let it go. I mean, you have, you have to make sure it makes sense. Sometimes if you do the verbal thing and you read it, you're like, ah, that's not even what I said. You got to make it make sense. But don't fret over getting everything perfect. Um, I was talking about this to someone in a group, a work, workplace group, and someone raised her and said, I'm a perfectionist. She says, I have to have my laundry and the towels, everything folded exactly right. And she said, and I make my kids and my husband do the same thing. So she's putting her perfectionism onto everybody else, right? So here's the thing. If you're a perfectionist, this is tough because it's going against kind of who you are. But it is a, you can really waste some time doing this. So I want to encourage you to think about when is good enough good enough? If you can take everything you're working on and say, does this have to be done perfectly or is it or is it OK that it's not? And if it's OK that it's not, what's good enough? And that's a good way to begin to get over your profession, perfectionistic tendencies. The next distorted thinking is disqualifying the positives. I don't know what it is about us humans, but it seems like we always want to um, put down someone who gives us a compliment. 
you know, um, we should really be um, welcoming those compliments because frankly, we don't get enough of them. So when you're disqualifying the positive, you're dwelling more on the negatives and you might miss seeing or devalue those positives around. I've already talked about that with the what went well and some of the other things we've talked about today. So think about um, what might be a way to not disqualify the positive. So let me just give an example. Let's say you're making a post on the myositis support uh, group site. Um, you make a post and someone responds and you, they say, you know what, Tom, that was so inspiring for me. That really lifted my day. Well, instead of going back and saying, oh, no, it was nothing. Go back and say, thank you. I really, I'm so happy to hear that. So don't disqualify it, savor it and um, be thankful for it and express that. And the last one is jumping to conclusions. So we're all good at this, right? Um, we can so easily project onto other people what they're thinking uh, or what they're judge how they might be judging us when maybe they're not. Um, and a lot of times we do this just based on our own thinking without really having the facts of the situation. So one way that we do it is mind reading where um, we might do something like this, where Brandon in the support group, uh, you might say, you know what? He hasn't been responding to my emails or my texts or my posts. He must not like me anymore. Well, now you're jumping to conclusions about Brandon and how he feels about you just because he hasn't responded. There could be a million reasons why he hasn't responded. Fortune, fortune telling is where you, um, you guess and predict where things are gonna go. So you could say, I just know that my next visit with the doctors is, is gonna be a bad one because um, my symptoms are getting worse. Well, you're projecting that it's going to be bad. Maybe not. Maybe there are going to be some great things you learn there that are, it's going to help your myositis better than it ever has before. So try to avoid jumping to con conclusions. And the best way to do that is to check your brain when it does it and try to get the facts. Marcus Aurelius, the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Therefore, guard accordingly. So keep your thoughts in a positive, upbeat, but realistic uh, way. The last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, about flipping negativity with you all is this idea of a growth mindset. I don't know if you guys have heard about this concept. It's written in a book and many articles and TED Talks, whatever, by Carol Dweck. She's done a lot of research on mindset and what this growth mindset is. And she, she um, puts mindset into two categories. One is a fixed mindset. Now a fixed mindset is a belief that our intelligence and our talent, our abilities are fixed. We got them from birth and that's it, they can't change. So we, we feel like, uh, what, what happens is we don't take risks because we feel like I'm kind of, you know, it is what it is. Um, we tend to blame others because I, this is what I got. You know, what's your problem? And I want to give you an example. So let me grab this. So when I was, when I was in the second grade, my, um, I, we had to do an art project in my class. And I remember drawing a school bus, maybe some little stick figure kids. I thought it was fabulous, but I didn't get a good grade on it. So from the second grade on, I thought that I couldn't do art, that I could not, you know, I didn't even try. So if I did anything art, it was just stick figures. Well, it was only about four or five years ago, a group of girlfriends were, and I were on a weekend vacation together. And we did that paint and sip where you bring in an artist who, and we all get canvases and she walks you through all right, dip it in the blue and the green and then do this. And I made a picture and I'm kind of proud of it. See my picture? How about that, huh? That's gorgeous. Now, yeah. 
I never would have thought I could do that. And it's just, you know, with the right, with the right prompting, the right education and the right support, I found out I could do better at art. So that's the difference between a fixed mindset and what we're now going to look at is a growth mindset. And this is the mindset she encourages us to try to develop. So a growth mindset says that our intelligence and our talent, our capabilities um, are not fixed. We can change them. We can improve them. So if we make a mistake, it doesn't matter because we can learn from that. Where if, if a fixed mindset makes a mistake, it's a pretty bad thing. And here's the key to it. It's effort and hard work that helps us move forward. And that's the key to a growth mindset, not intelligence, not capabilities, but the effort to get better and improve. And that way failure is a gift because I know if I make a mistake or something goes wrong, I'm gonna learn from it. I'm gonna get better because of it. That's the growth mindset. Now I wanna go through this chart because I love this chart, how it compares the two mindsets. And I'm thinking the fixed mindset is more of the negativity. The growth mindset is more of the positivity. So a fixed mindset leads to a desire to look smart because I'm, I, I, you know, I was born smart or born good at this. You know, I'm a, I'm a great golfer. I'm a great this. And therefore a tendency to see challenges. You want to, you know, if you feel that way, you want to avoid challenges. When you have an obstacle, you give up easily. Um, you see effort as fruitless or worse. You ignore useful negative uh, feedback in regard to criticism. You hate criticism. And you feel threatened by the success of others because if they're successful, that means you're not so successful. Now, a growth mindset, just this is what I want you to think about as we leave today. I want you to think about how you're going to apply these. So a growth mindset leads to a desire to learn and therefore a tendency to embrace challenges. We want them because it's going to make us better. Um, persist in setbacks. That's how we're going to face our obstacles. We're going to be persistent. We're going to hang in there. We're going to keep trying. And that gets to effort. See the effort as a path to mastery, which is something that humans love to get better at things. Um, criticism, we're not afraid of it because we're going to learn from it. And then we're going to see the success of others, not as a threat, but as inspiration. Because if they can get better at that, maybe we can too. So that's the fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. So for yourself, think about how you could change to a growth mindset if you have a fixed mindset. Now, let me tell you, you can have a growth mindset in some aspects of your life. And a fixed mindset in other aspects of your life. I'm not saying that you're either 100% growth mindset, 100% fixed. So with me, the art was a fixed mindset where my ability to learn science, I was thrilled about. I had a growth mindset for. OK, so it's different things that we feel fixed about versus that we feel um, growth about. But when you look at the things that you feel like you have a fixed mindset on, try to hear that mindset voice that's saying some of those things that was just in that last slide. Recognize that you have a choice. We're going to use our prefrontal cortex, our 40%. Talk back to it and listen and take action. Now, we can have a fixed mindset on other people, not just ourselves. So we may have someone in our family, someone in our community, our faith community, or regular community, someone here, there, at work, or whatever, that we kind of prejudge with a fixed mindset. We think we think of them in a fixed mindset that they're just that way. They can't change. You know, that's just that's just them. Where in fact they can change. So as I wrap this section up, I want you to think about for you, where's the place that you have a fixed mindset for you that you could change to a growth mindset? And think about how you might try to do that. And then I want you to think about other people that you are around where you've had this negative fixed mindset on them. And you decide that, wait a minute, I want to change to a growth mindset. I want to know that with effort and maybe they need a little education, maybe a little prompting, maybe they need something. 
uh, but they can actually get better at things. So it's not always the people who start out the smartest who end up the smartest. So those are the four strategies I wanted to show you. And with that, I'll turn it back to, um, Jer uh, to Jerry. Thanks, Janet. I don't see any questions yet, but I will say that I <laughs> struggle with <clears throat> one of the uh, things that you talked about was accepting compliments. That is a, that's a big thing for me. Like I, I always just feel like, oh, no, 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 just, you know, stop talking about, it. I don't want to hear that. You know, it's just like, it makes me feel like if I'm accepting a compliment that I'm being, um, prideful or something, right? Yeah. Like I, like I think so uh, much of myself or, you know, <clears throat> you know, he thinks so much of himself or something like that. So that's yeah. something that I have to work on. And I would encourage you to do that. And I would say the next time someone gives you a compliment, consciously think about owning it, thanking people for it, because that is an uplift for you. And you know what? It makes them feel better, too. Right. And that's what I that's what I got out of this is that, yeah, I'm not thinking about the other people. So, yeah, <laughs> um, Angela said uh, she just took four pages of notes. <laughs> uh, what was the name of Carol Dweck's book again? Called Mindset. 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 I actually have a final quote I forgot to share. Let me put this back up for y'all. Sure. Kay Yao. I don't know if any of you are from North Carolina. She was North Carolina State women's basketball coach for 32 seasons, eight-time national coach of the year in women's basketball. She took two women's basketball teams to Olympic gold. That gave her some national recognition as well. Uh, she got breast cancer. Uh, she actually died a, a, a few years ago. But I happened to be hearing her as she was interviewed in um, on one of the morning mag, you know, TV shows. And they as she was she was dealing with her treatment for breast cancer and she was still coaching. And they said, how are you doing this? And I love her quote. And I think it's a good one for all of us to hold and move forward with. She said, when life kicks you, let it kick you forward. So let the negativity kick you in a forward movement. So I thought I would just uh, share that with you all. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Jim, thank you so very much for your excellent information and experience that you shared with us so freely. And it's just so appreciated. It's my pleasure, Jerry. Thanks for asking me. And I wish you all the best in your journey. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. We really appreciate it.